I am clearing my throat. So that means we are going to start, because we like to be very punctual here at the ADB. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. I'm Zainab Badawi, and it's my great pleasure to be moderating the um, annual Governor's Seminar. Uh, it's always wonderful to be in your beautiful country, um, Governor Diokno, here in uh, the Philippines. I've been several times President Massa. Wonderful to meet you in person at last, um, having met you um, online. And um, but we've got a lot to cover in this um, coming hour because, you know, the whole world is kind of involved in a juggling act, a very, very serious one, which is what we're going to be discussing in this seminar, which is called Pathways to Sustainable Green Growth in the Time of COVID-19 Recovery. Difficult, isn't it? Because, you know, people are looking to immediate relief and help with the crisis that has been created by COVID in so many ways, you know, exacerbating inequalities and all the rest of it. And yet at the same time, not losing sight of those very, very important green goals and tackling um, climate change. And you've only got to look around the region in Asia and the Pacific to see, you know, countries that have experienced drought, others that have experienced extreme flooding, um, been a difficult storm here in the Philippines. And so, you know, we are aware almost on a daily basis from somewhere in the world that uh, climate change is a very, very pressing issue and is a huge priority for the Asian Development Bank and indeed the countries um, in the region. And um, of course, this comes against a very difficult international background. We, we see, you know, huge inflationary pressure tightening monetary policy conditions as well as narrowing fiscal space, which really makes it difficult to respond to both the immediate and medium and long-term challenges. Progress has been made, so we mustn't lose sight of that, but that's what we really want to hear in, the, um, in this seminar today. Uh, we want to really ask three broad questions. Is developing Asia and the Pacific prepared to navigate these many challenges and lay a suitable path for economic recovery. Also, what principles can we look at to both bring about short-term relief as well as, as I said, not losing sight of the longer-term goals in, um, for green investment and, and building climate resilience? And also, what supporting role the ADB and its partners can do to help bring all this about? Um, we have, it's a live audience, and I, I want to invite you all to use the pigeonhole um, system, which is a very simple interactive mobile website um, where you can submit questions. And you can also vote on any questions that interest you. Um, the more votes a question gets, the more likely we'll be able to address it. And if you're watching us virtually, I should just say click the Q&A icon on the right side of the page, and it will direct you to the session's Q&A. And if you're here with us, you may use your smartphone or tablet to scan the QR codes you see on the screen or launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.com into the address bar. And the next thing you should do is key in our event passcode, which is ADBMNL55. So that's ADBMNL55. So do send your uh, questions through to us. Um, Let's start our uh, discussion. <clears throat> Dr. Benjamin Diokno, you are the governor for the Philippines. You're also the secretary at the Ministry of Finance um, here in the Philippines. You've only been in the job for a few weeks. So you've had to hit the ground running, but you've had a lot of experience because you've actually worked in finance under four former presidents. You were budget secretary under three, and uh, you also had some stints as um, governor of the Central Bank of the Philippines. So you bring a whole host of experience to um, the discussion today. Um, and you've set yourself three broad development uh, goals by 2028. You want to reduce the deficit to GDP ratio to pre-pandemic levels. You want to reduce poverty to single digits um, here in the Philippines. And you also want to achieve upper middle income economy status for the country. So very ambitious goals there to achieve by 2028. But you're facing the challenges that I outlined, you know, the tightening mon monetary conditions, inflationary pressure, and also disruptions to global trade um, and, and stability. So 
how are you here in the Philippines evaluating the trade-offs between these competing priorities? And with, uh, do you still have the fiscal space for the green investments that you want to um, introduce? Thank you for that question. Luckily, the Philippines has, despite the pandemic and the uh, uh, emerging risk international because of the high oil prices, etc., it has actually maintained its financial footing, right? Um, and that I attribute that to the fact that the previous administration has actually reformed our tax system significantly, and also that uh, we have uh, we didn't sit idly by while the virus is rampaging. Okay, we did a lot of structural reforms. We opened up the economy. And so now the, we are in a better position to face our, the problems moving forward. And so now I joined this ad new administration and uh, we have a uh, eight point agenda, medium, long, short term, medium term. The short term uh, focus of course is on uh, the inflationary pressures and this is felt by all, all countries in the world, emerging and developed countries. The, so that's the immediate concern, and of course the scarring effect of the pandemic. We have to make sure that because we closed our schools for like an extended period, that the the young the young men and women should should get the 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 care that will help them in in, in the future. The long the long term effect, of course, is by reforming. Uh, we have to adapt. Uh, digitalization, this is in, in, in light of the new challenges. And so, uh, but fiscal discipline, I think, will, is, is the core of our, of our program, okay? We have adopted the first ever, if for the Philippines, a medium-term fiscal framework that will address the three problems that you mentioned. Cut the, uh, the deficit to GDP ratio, cut the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, attain our medium, mid, uh, upper middle income status and cut poverty by 9%. And so uh, on, on the, on the uh, greening uh, program, uh, the, the, all these programs are embedded actually in our uh, medium term uh, development plan that we are designing at the moment. So, so we do not, we are not so much concerned about the fiscal space because to, to me, given what we have done, the fiscal space is still there, but we have embedded the, the, the uh, important greening programs moving forward. All right, thank you very much indeed for that. I'm sure we'll come back to some of those things that uh, you've raised there. I'd like to turn to um, you, Ana Rosa Mulipola. You are the governor for Samoa and you are the minister of finance in your country and you've an accountant by training and you've also had experience in the private sector. So you bring that kind of dual vision to your role. Uh, obviously, a lot of countries in the Asia Pacific region really do are very vulnerable to climate change. We have a lot of coastal cities and uh, particularly in the Pacific, you're going to see um, a diverse set of climate challenges. And sadly, they're only going to get worse. So in the coming years, what kind of specific climate change related support do you want to see from the Asian Development Bank? Well, Talofa and greetings to all governors, um, ADB president, uh, fellow panelists, and our audience this morning. I am grateful for the opportunity to be one of the panelists for this seminar to share Samoa's experience and also to hear from other panelists. Um, Samoa, like other Pacific Island um, countries, is highly exposed to natural disasters, uh, such as tropical cyclones, earthquake, tsunami, drought, volcanic eruptions, and floods. These have and will continue to have major impacts on our economies. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic, in addition to the threats of natural hazards and the effects of climate change, threaten our small islands, eroding development gains and impacting debt sustainability and our long-term survival. 
Given the cross-cutting um, impact of climate change on all sectors of the economy, Samoa would welcome ADB's deeper engagement through a climate change integrated policy-based lending. Through provision of general budget support, the bank would effectively contribute to climate proofing of public and community infrastructure investment, therefore building resilience for a greener development pathway. Elevated contingent disaster financing would also allow Samoa to better respond to disasters and cater for effective recovery measures. Secondly, support towards the target for a nationally determined contribution, NDC, would, we, would be welcomed given our international climate change commitments of reporting on the reduction of emissions. The Pacific as a challenging environment for implementation of climate change uh, mitigation project means carbon credits derived from such initiative would be highly valued. These carbon credits can be exchanged for funds, which can then be used for sustainable development. And through this approach, ADB would be leveraging this innovative source of revenue for seeds such as Samoa. Third, the ease of access to climate change financing facility. ADB needs to hear and learn from the experiences of members in accessing similar climate change assistance to help ADB design a more responsive and accountable climate change response facility, especially for the seeds. For instance, the, safe, the review of, safe, of ADB policy statement should ensure simplicity in the process for accessing climate change funds and accountability through implementation of such initiatives. In addition, Samoa strongly supports a direct bilateral engagement between ADB and member country in implementation of the climate change financing facility, rather than using third party entities for accreditation and management of project. Sorry, it's a long answer. <laughs> no, no, it's very, very interesting. Thank you for setting that out so um, clearly. Um, Governor Mulipola, and, and you've thrown down the gauntlet there, and actually let me come to uh, the Governor of Finland. Um, hello, Pasi Hellman, who joins us via video link. Hi, from um, Helsinki. You're the Under Secretary of State at the Ministry for Finance, and you bring um, 30 years experience working in national and multilateral um, organizations. Um, look, most member countries of, of the ADB have set ambitious targets on climate under the Paris Agreement. But times have really changed. We've seen the Russian invasion of Ukraine having a huge impact on energy. And of course, that's forced some countries or a lot of countries to reassess their energy and climate policies and so on. So given all the headwinds in the global economy, including that, do you think that strategies on meeting the targets need some kind of adjustment and what role does the ADB and other actual development partners have to play in this? Thank you and uh, distinguished uh, panelists, uh, distinguished audience. My sincere regrets, first of all, for not being able to be in person there, but uh, in today's world, uh, particularly with regards to long distance intercontinental travel and uh, its restrictions, it actually hit me and made it not possible for me to take my planned trip there. Uh, to a question, first of all, even if uh, geopolitical tensions and as you mentioned, uh, particularly Russia's invasion of Ukraine and its effects on energy and food security are there, we still need to keep the long term goal clear. Uh, mitigating climate change and moving away from fossil fuels is a must as delayed action will only cost more. In Europe, we can see that uh, the situation that we are in demands us to accelerate the green transition. In fact, our energy challenges would not be so difficult now if we had been faster 
earlier in green transition. Uh, secondly, and more glo from global perspective, from uh, the perspective of developing countries as well, uh, one answer is to pay more attention on adaptation to climate change. Uh, Finland is an active member in the Champions Group on Adaptation Finance, which tries to increase the quantity, quality and access of adaptation finance. And we, for example, hosted a very fr uh, fruitful so-called Lahti Adaptation Finance Ministerial uh, meeting on adaptation finance in April this year with uh, key participants uh, and, and uh, also low uh, uh, least developed countries and small island development states uh, participating there, discussing the barriers, success stories and way forward. Uh, we actually need to combine financing, public and private and actors with the best solution to climate adaptation. For example, early warning systems have tremendous potential and Finland has worked with many countries also in Asia and we can, we can de show demonstrated results there. One more thing I'd like to mention, uh, as, as was already referred to, uh, narrowing budgetary and fiscal space, it's becoming more and more difficult to guarantee big flows of ODA to all dire needs. And that's why we have to work even harder to ensure uh, different development financing institutions and entities to have shared goals and better coordination at, uh, among themselves. And we, first of all, have to be smart. For climate mitigation, there are clearly more private and commercial financing available and public money can facilitate, catalyze by preparing and making projects bankable. And on the adaptation financing, uh, sometimes the opportunities for private financing are less obvious, but we do actually have good examples of innovative uh, and uh, uh, methods and approaches to use public funding and then those uh, approaches can be replicated and scaled up to bring also private money also to uh, adaptation work. And if I may, uh, one more point on, on, on how, to, how to respond to challenges. I think, and we think it's, it's to increase and enhance the link between economic decision makers and climate change decision makers. The role of finance ministers in climate action should be strengthened to ensure sustainability, uh, and maximum benefits of climate work. And Finland has initiated and is currently co-chairing coalition of finance ministers for climate action, uh, which uh, is a driver in this development and it's already including more than 75 finance ministers around the world. Thank you very much indeed, um, Governor Hellman. And um, you raise uh, two very important points uh, amongst all the things you were saying. And thank you for reminding us that um, when we talk about climate finance, it's not just for mitigation, which tends to be the emphasis in Europe, but adaptation, uh, two sides of the same coin, and also the need for co-investment from both the public and private sectors. Points um, very, very well made. Thank you. And it's good to see you, even though it's only virtual. Thank you for being with us. Um, let me turn to you, Shunichi Suzuki. You're the governor for Japan, and you're the minister um, of finance and also um, you have in the past been Minister of the Environment so you really do bring um, the expertise for, 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 from that point of view. Um, so uh, let me ask you what role do you think that the ADB and other and donors within the ADB member countries should play to ensure that you can try to ensure that you have green growth goals at this very difficult time of COVID-19 recovery? I mean, how, how do you get the balance right? Thank you, Ms. Padaway. Thank you. The COVID-19 slowed growth and made the debt situation even more difficult in Asia-Pacific region with negative impact on our steady step toward poverty reduction. Russia's aggression against Ukraine and the increase of global energy and food price are hitting the economy across the region. In order to achieve resilient and sustainable growth and such situation, we need to create a new world 
after COVID-19 while continuing inclusive support so that no one will be left behind. In doing so, it is important to achieve green growth, that is to understand climate change not as a challenge but as an opportunity to achieve sustainable economic growth. ADB has long been providing support in infrastructure and is very strong both in financial and technical aspect. So I expect ADB to strongly take initiatives in quality infrastructure investment. In order to help member countries in the region adapt to climate change. In addition, we need to respect the ownership of each developing country and recognize their different situations. When it is difficult for them to switch to a renewable energy source in a single step, we need to support their gradual transition so that they can take scientific and realistic approaches for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. ADB launched the energy transition mechanism over ETM at COP26 last year. This is an innovative action to promote early retirement of coal-fired power plants in realistic manner. Japan expects other donors and ESG investors to join this initiative. Finally, I would like to stress the importance of enhancing debt sustainability and transparency in order to promote investments to Asia countries, which is necessary for green growth. It is important that ADB supports Asian countries to proceed necessary reform and capacity building. Donors cooperation through sharing debt data is also important to achieve enhanced debt transparency. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Governor Suzuki, and especially in reminding us that, you know, when we're talking about all this, we've seen how COVID-19 has exacerbated inequalities and your comment that uh, we should find policies that leave no one behind are very, very important. And also there isn't necessarily a universal one size fits all approach that, as you say, countries should have ownership of their own um, national vision and plans. Thank you for that. President Massa, so you've heard what um, the governors have been saying here, and they've raised um, some very interesting uh, points. So you're operating, as we said, against this very difficult background, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, also a huge slowdown in China, you know, one of the real engines of the global um, economy, tightening monetary policy conditions and so on. And, um, you know, all these things demand urgent attention. So how are you trying to perform this juggling act by trying to make sure that immediate concerns are met because people are in crisis, you know, the cost of living crisis is really affecting people very badly, whilst at the same time not losing sight of those medium-term uh, green goals. I mean, are there any trade-offs? Yeah, thank you, Zainab. Mm. Well, uh, it's true uh, that it has been sometimes argued uh, that under the circumstances, ADB should uh, uh, focus, concentrate on immediate uh, response for COVID-19 and also uh, other uh, new challenges we are facing and uh, putting less priorities on a medium-term uh, development agenda, such as climate change, uh, quality infrastructure, uh, gender, and the poverty reduction, and so on. But for, frankly speaking, uh, whenever I hear this kind of question, I I wonder why we are supposed to choose one of them. Hmm. Because, you know, short-term, you know, response measure and uh, a medium to long-term long agenda are not mutually exclusive, I believe. For example, if as the World 
global economy recovers from pandemic and also other crises, it's inevitable that uh, emission of greenhouse gas uh, uh, would increase. And it, it has increased uh, uh, already, uh, uh, unless we don't do anything. Also, our analysis says uh, that 80 million, 80 million people were pushed back into absolute poverty in 2020 in this region due to pandemic. So I think you know, those uh, short-term measures uh, to deal with uh, uh, you know, current crisis and medium to long-term uh, uh, development agenda are closely linked to each other. Rather, we see our immediate response as an opportunity uh, to transform our economy uh, towards a more uh, inclusive and sustainable uh, development. Probably, uh, the energy insecurity issue we are currently facing and the medium-term climate change issue, uh, it's a good example of how ADB is supporting uh, our DMC developed member countries uh, for their immediate needs without jeopardizing, jeopardizing uh, the medium-term commitment uh, under uh, our strategy 2030. Many DMCs are really suffering from excessive volatility in the energy market, one of these days, uh, due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and other inflationary factors. So, as a result, governments are forced uh, to expand its uh, fiscal expenditure uh, to, to take care of vulnerable and poor. That, that's inevitable. So, uh, in response, ADB quickly uh, enhanced, uh, uh, quite recently, one of our financial instruments called CSF, which stands for uh, Counter-Cyclical Support Facility, uh, which provides very emergency uh, financing uh, 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 to support the MCs to expand their counter-cyclical uh, fiscal expenditure to mitigate uh, the impact uh, caused by the exogenous shocks like uh, food, uh, food price increase, energy price increase, and, and so on. But at the same time, uh, we are working very hard on the medium-term climate agenda, uh, decarbonization, how to decarbonize uh, this region, which accounts for more than 50% of global greenhouse gas emission. Uh, for example, through ETM, uh, as uh, uh, Minister Suzuki mentioned, uh, which stands for Energy trans, uh, Transmission uh, tr tr Transition Mechanism. Uh, the issue is, uh, in this region, there are so many you know, coal-fired power plants already existing and operating, and they are really relatively young. Young means less than 20 years old. So if we don't do anything, uh, they will just stay on another 10 years, 20 years, and even 30 years. So what we should do is to let uh, those you know, very inefficient, dirty uh, coal-fired power plants retire as quickly as possible. So ETM will do this job. ETM is a very innovative financing in instrument which combines a commercial financing uh, provided by financial, private sector financial institutions with highly concessional financing or grant money provided by bilateral donors to achieve very low cost financing. It's called branded financing. So take advantage by take by taking advantage of this uh, you know, branded financing scheme, uh, the expected return of each uh, coal-fired power plant uh, financed under ETM mechanism uh, could be achieved in shorter period of time, in shorter time horizon. That's how ETM could let them retire early. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, and we, we are piloting this ETM right now on uh, three countries, uh, Philippines, Vietnam, and Indonesia. And I hope uh, that this ETM mechanism would become one of the most powerful uh, carbon reduction model uh, in the world. Uh, so this is just one example, you know, uh, but uh, I think we are trying to strike uh, the right balance uh, between the uh, demand uh, immediate demand uh, by the uh, developing member countries facing uh, uh, various challenges and uh, a medium term development agenda laid out uh, by uh, SDGs and also uh, by our strategy 2030. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. And uh, perhaps a little later on, um, Governor Diokno, you might 
give us a, a perspective on how the energy transition mechanism is going down in the Philippines because as uh, President Massa mentioned, you along with Indonesia and Vietnam are one of the three pilot countries. But, um, and I should just remind you, please, audience, remember, do submit your questions. I've got my pigeonhole here. So if there's anything you want you know, to, to raise, please, please do, and also to our online um, audience. But I want to pick up with you, um, Governor Hellman, um, a point which President uh, Massa made very clearly in his intervention just there, that it's not an either-or situation. You've got to provide that short-term emergency help. After all, he says in the region, 80 million people have been pushed into uh, poverty. He also mentioned the gender aspect to this because, very important of course, let's not forget that a disproportionate number of those people who've been pushed into poverty are women. Um, and, you know, we've seen education and health really take a battering throughout COVID. But what principle, and you have said the same, that actually we mustn't lose sight of those green goals and had we been more vigilant about introducing them perhaps it would have uh, mitigated the situation that uh, the world finds itself in now but what principles do you think can help ensure that both short-term relief measures and those broader recovery strategies um, can be sustainable and also climate resilient how do you get that you know, that, that balance, balance so that it's not an either or situation. Um, thank you for that question, uh, Sinab. Um, I think the principles are actually uh, quite simple. Strong, diversified, inclusive, and sustainable economies are the most resilient in situations of external shocks, also, and, and pandemics. Uh, I'll mention two more concrete principles. Um, Circular economy is an ex excellent example of an economic approach which uh, reduces primary resource use and also creates new business opportunities. Uh, this could spearhead economic growth in Asia. Uh, for us in Finland, circular economy is a key element in our transition to carbon neutral and resource efficient, resource wise society. And uh, by the way, we also have a target to become carbon neutral by 2035. Another principle, uh, private businesses develop new technologies and innovations and also execute uh, climate projects. Uh, this is, as I mentioned earlier, particularly important in mitigating climate change. And, and the world really needs renewable energy and energy efficiency solutions that are scalable also in developing countries and make good uh, business sense. And this, again, is where public funding can help to mitigate risks, to pave way, for private sector uh, to enter new markets. Thank you very much indeed. Let me come to you, Governor um, Uli Pola, because you've heard what's being said there. And I just want to ask you a very blunt question, really. I mean, what services from multilateral institutions like the ADB have been of the greatest value to you and which have been the least useful? Um. Sorry, President Massa. She's going to be honest here. Start, start which, have, with which have been the most useful, perhaps, <laughs> then go to the bad news, least useful. <laughs> well, first of all, um, let me take this opportunity to convey Samoa's gratitude to uh, multi multilateral institution and uh, ADB in this case um, for the support and close working relationship in the past few uh, challenging years. While the pandemic-related restriction greatly delayed the implementation of programs and projects, the support through uh, public finance management policies, contingent financing, and other quick dispersing mechanisms help reduce the negative impacts of the pandemic on our economy and our people. We have been fortunate to access contingent financing from both ADB, CDF, and the World Bank get DDO. The COVID-19 pandemic response facility of the ADB also provided relief to our government in trying to revive and stimulate the economy, especially for those sectors greatly affected by the pandemic, such as tourism. The available standby support 
meant predictability of resources than enable Samoa to plan, fund, and implement its nas national disaster response plan in a timely manner. Therefore, both contingent financing and general budget supports in the form of grants have been of greatest value over the last few years and should be made available over the longer term given the increasing impacts of climate change. Thank you. Well, yeah, useful. Yeah. <laughs> she, yeah. <laughs> Did, you, you, you haven't got anything more to say then on the least useful? No? <laughs> I will think have you have. directly to the president. Oh, she's <laughs> been very diplomatic here. I think this you requires know, a bilateral. <laughs> it's going to be a bilateral. But clearly, a, a lot of um, help, as you say, in trying to meet your, 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 the, the challenges that you, um, that you face. But uh, let me come to you, um, Minister Suzuki, <coughs> and ask you a blunt question. Am I, I mean, why shouldn't we prioritise recovery from COVID-19 over you know, achieving green growth? Why shouldn't we? Because a lot of people have taken such a hammering from COVID-19. Uh, in order to uh, recover from COVID-19, uh, fiscal support alone will, be, uh, will not be enough. Uh, we need sustainable growth to ensure the recovery. The efforts to achieve green growth are exactly what we need to move in the right direction. In particular, climate change adaptation and mitigation measures which require quality infrastructure investment, use of new technologies and renewal of infrastructure can create new markets and job opportunities. This can be part of the growth strategy that move forward recovery from COVID-19. At the same time, it is also important to strengthen health systems, which Japan has been strongly supporting, and to invest in human capital through education. By doing so, I believe we can foster more prosperous society. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, and, and thank you for reminding us, uh, Minister Suzuki, about the importance of maintaining those social investments in, in education and health. Um, Governor Diok, no, I mean, mitigating the impacts of COVID-19 obviously has caused debt to grow significantly in many countries, and it means that, you know, this creates new challenges when it comes to meeting your spending needs. So how are you in the Philippines? striking that balance between support for those affected by the ongoing challenges whilst at the same time trying to maintain prudent fiscal management very important well uh, before before the pandemic our debt to gdp ratio was less than 40 percent that's that's pretty good yeah but because of the pandemic it went up to around 62 percent not not bad manageable other countries have 200 percent okay yeah. But we would like to go back to, to the, the lower number. So that's part of the medium-term fiscal framework that we adopted. Okay, so we will, as I said, uh, we will enhance our uh, tax collection. And we can do that through digitalization. And I said we, the previous government reformed our tax system significantly. And so given improved tax administration and a, a better tax structure, we will be able to reduce our debt to GDP ratio to around 51% uh, by the end of the president's term, means 2020-2028. Now on the deficit, the deficit went up to around 6%. Deficit to GDP ratio went up to 6% uh, as a result of the pandemic, but we used to have around, only around 3%. So that is our also our goal, and we will attain that by uh, the end of 2028. So uh, a combination of uh, prudent, uh, rather better tax collection, plus reforming the bureaucracy. I think things have changed significantly as a result of the pandemic, mm -hmm. and things have really changed significantly since 20 years ago. Now with the digitalization, we really need to adjust uh, government. So we're right-sizing the government, 
uh, to, to adapt uh, better, better uh, techniques. And also in pursuit of prudent debt management and domestic capital market, we plan to, to uh, have a healthy mix in the financing. We, our target is that 70%, 75% of our debt should be financed through domestic means and 25% through foreign borrowings. And this is because we want to minimize the foreign exchange risk, which is also, as you can see. Right now, the composition of the, our debt is 69% uh, domestic and 31% uh, foreign. So we're very close to our, our target. And plus, uh, most of our foreign debt are medium to long term. If, if I remember right, the average uh, maturity will about be uh, cl close to around 20, 20 years. So we're in pretty good shape co moving forward. Mm. Very interesting. You say that you want to meet most of your needs through domestic resource mobilization, 75% and only 25% on the external financing, which is, of course, very important, isn't it, President Massa? But, you know, we are, we are saying, seeing, as I said, you know, limited fiscal space. So, you know, how can governments can continue to be responsive whilst at the same time ensuring fiscal sustainability? And... Um, you know, DRM is, is very, very important. I mean, what, what role can the ADB play in all this? Mm. Thank you, Zena. Yes, uh, due to the long-lasting uh, low interest rate uh, environment uh, previously and su subsequent uh, fiscal expansion uh, to deal with COVID-19 and other crises, in almost in every country, uh, the fiscal situation, the fiscal deficit situation, and public debt situation uh, got worsened. And in a sense, it was inevitable. Uh, but uh, I'm quite sure in the process of recovery uh, from those uh, you know, crises, I think you know, timing uh, would come uh, to every country uh, to change, uh, shift the gears uh, from fiscal expansion to fiscal consolidation. Of course, you know, countries should pick up at the right time to do so. It cannot be too early. It cannot be too late. And also pace of physical consolidation cannot be too fast, uh, too slow. But anyhow, in the process of uh, you know, forthcoming fiscal consolidation process, I think DRM is really, really you know, uh, plays a significant role, uh, which means you know, how to raise uh, domestic tax revenue. Uh, in my opinion, DRM is very, very critical uh, from uh, two perspectives. First, uh, it is needed uh, to make uh, your country's uh, social welfare system uh, robust and sustainable. For example, aging. Japan is really you know, suffering from aging together with you know, Thailand, uh, China, Korea, and so on. But uh, you know, aging is coming to every country sooner or later. And in order to in order to cope with aging, of course, uh, you know what is needed, among others, is to introduce a well-designed and reliable uh, public pension scheme, and also a, a, a medical insurance scheme, and so on. And in, in order for those uh, social welfare systems in that country are uh, financially viable, it's much better, much better to rely on uh, depend on domestic resources rather than uh, relying too much on external financing, which would simply uh, worsen uh, your debt sustainability situation. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, secondly, I would say uh, tax policy is a good policy instrument, not only to uh, raise tax revenue in general, uh, but to achieve each of the development goals uh, read out by SDGs and also by our strategy 2030. For example, it might be a good idea uh, to take uh, full, uh, make full use of progressivity of personal income tax system or introduction of uh, property tax, wealth tax, to address income inequality situation, which I am quite sure uh, got worsened uh, during the pandemic, pandemic era. And also, another example is uh, it might be a, a feasible policy option to rely on carbon tax or other type of environmental uh, related taxation uh, to address the climate change issue, to finance 
uh, climate change issue uh, in your country. So this is just one of the few examples uh, you know, where uh, tax policy could uh, contribute uh, to some of the uh, develop development and agendas uh, we have to address. Uh, but uh, there are many, many you know, areas I, I, I do believe uh, that tax policy uh, contribute to it. And last year, as you may know it, the ADB launched the so-called Asia Pacific uh, 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 Regional Tax Hub to promote tax policy uh, dialogue and knowledge sharing, uh, uh, coordination with other development partners, and also encourage uh, the, you know, uh, our DMCs to participate in ITC, which stands for International Tax Cooperation, like BEPS. So I hope uh, many countries will join this tax hub uh, to have a very active you know, discussion on tax policy uh, in the context of both DRC, DRM, and domestic resource mobilization, and ITC, International Tax Cooperation. Thank you very much indeed. Very important also for you to remind us that, you know, when we're talking about tax, that progressive tax system to address inequalities is a very important instrument. Thank you. Great. We're getting questions thick and fast here. Um, so let me give one to you because it's specific to you, um, Governor Passi Hellman for Finland. How can donor countries offer more inclusive support for boosting economic recovery in Asia? There you go. Um. Thank you. Of course, the obvious uh, uh, answer would be to provide financing, uh, but also to, to uh, share experiences, both of them to create decent jobs, uh, supporting climate innovation actions, and, and promoting, of course, inclusiveness and, and gender equality. Of course, uh, major countries, uh, US, China, G7, they have their uh, development and, and investment uh, packages and programs uh, aimed at, at uh, countries around the world and uh, and they're welcome and needed if implemented in a, in a fair and a transparent manner. I'd like to mention the program from uh, the European Union, which is the Global Gateway Initiative, which was launch, launched in uh, December 2021. Global Gateway will mobilize 300 billion euros of investments for major invest, uh, infrastructure development around the world and outside of the European Union by 2027. And in addition to sectoral investments in the green and digital transition and transport, the strategy puts emphasis on health and education and it should help sustainable connections uh, globally. And, and we think that by offering this choice for global development based on the needs of our partners, Global Gateway will be an investment in international stability and cooperation. And also countries in Asia and the Pacific will be eligible for seeking funding for projects funded under the Global Gateway framework, which will also actively work with multilateral development banks, including the ADB. Thanks. Expand a little bit on, on your answer there, Governor Hellman, because we've also had um, a, a question which relates to what you've just talked about. How can the private sector contribute to the green transition in the Asian Pacific region and which incentives are needed for them to get more involved? Because as I said, this co-investment between the public and private is absolutely critical, as you say. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, global, global Gateway is all about that it's it's combining and and bringing in both uh, uh private and public funding and 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 to use public funding in an intelligent smart manner to uh crowd in and and, and facilitate and catalyze uh, uh private private funding it's actually a, a, a sort of an umbrella program uh, meaning that it contains funding from various European Union institutions, uh, European Commission, European Investment Bank, uh, but also from the European Union member states. So this is a very, very comprehensive program and, uh, and, and, and the pure size of it will, will hopefully mean that it will be a transformative program as well. I'm sure lots of people listening to this are going to want to look at this gateway program. Thank you for that, Governor Hellman. Um, yes, of course, President Massa, yeah. yeah. Uh, a little bit in different context, but, uh, you know, inclusiveness, inclusiveness. You know, talking of inclusiveness, uh, we cannot forget to discuss uh, just transition, which is another very important component of, uh, uh, you know, low carbon transition. Because, you know, there are inevitably uh, people, uh, communities, uh, who, those are, who, who are adversely affect, affected uh, by low carbon transition. 
And uh, we have to make sure that uh, uh, nobody is left behind. And uh, uh, those who are affected uh, individuals and communities should be protected uh, uh, from any you know, negative impact uh, coming from uh, low carbon transition uh, by through, uh, for example, uh, appropriate uh, social welfare uh, function. And also, they need access to energy access, of course. Uh, so we have to make it sure uh, that they have enough access, uh, for example, uh, uh, by you know, su supplying more you know, renewable energy sources uh, uh, to you know, remote uh, villages and towns and so on. And also, in order to uh, ensure uh, their access to benefits of low carbon transition process, uh, we need to uh, introduce some systems uh, that they can, uh, you know, uh, build skills for green jobs, for example. Uh, we are now, uh, ADB is now uh, mobilizing our resources to build so-called Just Transition Platform uh, to support Just Transition uh, as uh, uh, DMC, our developed member countries, uh, deploy uh, climate uh, financing mechanism provided by ADB and other uh, development partners. And also we are uh, trying to incorporate just transition com uh, concept into our operation and policies. For example, the new energy policy we adopted last year uh, clearly uh, commits ADB uh, to uh, take care of uh, uh, just transition uh, for the all people uh, to support just transition to all people in the affected communities. And also we are incorporating the just transition uh, concept in uh, the ETM, uh, which I explained earlier. I tell you, President Massey, you must be a mind reader because you've actually answered two questions that are here on my pigeonhole. The one about, yes, I mean, financial inclusion can empower and improve the lives of rural people to adapt to climate change. What is the ABD doing about that? You've talked about the importance of inclusion there. And also we had um, a, a comment about young people have been hard hit by the wide-reaching labour market of the COVID-19 crisis in line with the SDG goal on uh, number eight on productive employment. And, and you talked about the importance and that you see that very much as a priority. So thank you for answering. That question, in fact, about jobs for young people has got a great number of votes. So um, clearly you hit the right button there. But um, Governor Diocno, there are, um, there are a couple of questions directly to you. First of all, is the Philippines interested in the $14 million fund for food security that was recently announced by the ADB? The short answer is definitely. Did you hear that, President Massa? Because as, as, Thumbs up uh, for that. Yes. As I look at the performance of the Philippine economy uh, for the last, say, two decades, and Industry is growing, uh, uh, services is growing, but agriculture has been in and out of recession. So it's what I call the laggard, and this is because of many structural defects in the in the sector, including, of course, the uh, the uh, agrarian reform program, which I consider to be a mild failure. And to give emphasis on agriculture. The president himself assumed the position of secretary of agriculture. So that, sits, that shows how important agriculture is as far as President Marcos is concerned. So definitely we will avail of this facility. Right. There's a related question as well for you, um, Governor, Minister Diocno. How will the Philippines develop Mindanao to fulfill its potential in terms of providing food requirements for the Philippines and to grow, grow more? I'd love to say that Mindanao is so rich that it can feed the whole country. Mm -hmm. so, we, so Mindanao is really also very important. And now that we have achieved peace in Mindanao, uh, there we will, we will focus on Mindanao. We, will, we have a new government set up there, and there's a lot of interest from our development partners. So we will, we will give emphasis to Mindanao also. Right, okay. And, and both you and Governor Hellman mentioned digitization. So there is a question also, what is the role of innovation and digitization in realizing green growth as the pandemic recovery strategy in developing economies? Do you want to think about that? And I go to Governor Hellman. Do you want a response on that? Because you touched on digitization. Unaware. Uh, <laughs> yes, 
Uh, digitalization, of course, uh, a, a, a topic that is very close to to, to Finland because we would like to think ourselves as, as being among the leaders in the world on, on that. And we are actually collaborating also with the ADB on, on, uh, on, uh, on, on the topic. Uh, uh, it's a small example, but I can maybe mention it here. It's something called ADB Ventures, which, which is a leading impact tech fund with strong climate and gender focus. And that is trying to crowd in other investors, venture capitalists and solutions into emerging Asian markets. So again, a very concrete example of uh, so-called blended financing, like President Massa was, was earlier referring to, uh, which is uh, trying to make sure that the private fund funding, private financing is coming also in the digitalization sector for the benefit of, of uh, development purposes. Achieved the uh, objective of government efficiency. And uh, from what we can get from there, then that we we can use that for our green objectives. Okay. All right, thank you very much indeed. So I've got to uh, wrap up in a minute, but just you know, a couple of questions that are worth raising. We've covered most of the ones we've got, but retiring coal plants early is easier said than done. How can the ADB assist countries which, uh, whose GDP relies on selling coal? We know that that coal is, usage is still very high in Asia. Is the ADB considering measures like disaster risk insurance and climate resilient debt clauses to help DMCs cope with climate uh, shocks? So uh, for those of you who've submitted questions that we've not been able to answer, do remember, of course, that there is a, a question and answer um, facility on the ADB website. So if you, I'm sorry if I've not had a chance to get to all your questions, but we've covered quite a large number of those that were submitted. A very quick final wrap-up question to all of you. I'll come to you first, uh, Governor Mulipola. So we're talking about pathways to sustainable recovery and green growth um, in, in the light of COVID-19 recovery. Is there a path towards green growth? And if so, what do you think is the first step? Yes, um, there is a path towards uh, green growth. In the case of Samoa, the path towards green growth is integrated in our national development plan. The pathway for the development of Samoa 2022 to 2026. The first step would be the government's commitment and ownership of its national development priorities that will determine the climate smart initiatives to be implemented. Thank you. Governor Hellman, brief response from you on that. Uh, yes, certainly there is a pathway. And um, first step, I would say mindset and change of mindset. Move away from thinking that the green transition would somehow become less important because of the other challenges and crises. Economics of climate change have not changed. It is in our long term interest really to continue and accelerate this work. Yeah, we recognize the critical role of sustainable finance in driving the shift to climate change adaptation and mitigation practices. Thank you. Oh, gosh, that was very sharp and sweet, wasn't it? Um, President Massa, so okay. is there a path towards green growth and what is the first step? Yeah, first step. I think it's about time for everybody to you know, uh, turn uh, policy into action. It's encouraging that so many countries uh, have set uh, a so-called uh, 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 carbon zero, uh, you know, the, the target, uh, very, very aggressive one, uh, uh, which is very encouraging. But uh, actually, mm, uh, the progress uh, to introduce a concrete action plan, how to you know achieve those goals, those, those targets, uh, remains very slow. For example. Only a handful of our, you know, our member countries has set so-called LTS, long-term uh, GSG emission uh, development strategy, which is, by the way, required under the Paris Agreement. So in the next couple of years, I think you know, countries should make a substantial progress uh, in uh, introducing a concrete action plan uh, towards the you know, uh, decarbonation uh, uh, act. And uh, ADB is more than happy uh, to support uh, you know, those countries' uh, efforts along that line uh, based on the uh, firm belief uh, that the low-carbon transition is fully compatible with uh, resilient and sustainable growth. 
Thank you very much indeed. That's all we have um, time for. Um, Governor Suzuki, Minister Suzuki, I think you already answered that in your earlier comments. So, Pasty Hellman, thank you very much indeed for joining us from Helsinki. Thank you, Governor Mulipola. Thank you, Dr. Diokno. Thank you, Minister Suzuki, and of course you, President Massa, all of you here in the hall with us, and all of you who've been listening to this Governor's Seminar online. It's been terrific to be with you. I think we've given you all a lot of food for thought. Difficult challenges, but don't lose sight of those goals. It's been my pleasure to be with you. From Ize Napadawi, thank you very much, and goodbye and enjoy the rest of the uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.